come to this year's Miami Seller Conference, you missed out. There was so much knowledge shared by some of the top minds in the industry, folks like myself, folks like Watch Me Amazon, Amazon Lit, Reezy Resells, Flips for Miles, Fields of Profit, Kaja Robinson, and so many more. Uh, and I gave a presentation at Miami Seller Conference about how to leverage virtual assistants to scale your Amazon wholesale business. And so today's podcast episode is actually gonna be a recording of that presentation. And this presentation was super tactical. There were tons of gems that I shared. So I want you guys to pay really close attention. I want you to take notes. And this is an episode that you're gonna to wanna to listen to at least twice. Now, before I jump into the episode, I wanted to quickly share a killer new update from the sponsor of this podcast, Seller Snap. So for those of you that don't know about Seller Snap, it is the most advanced AI-based repricer on the market. It has been my repricer of choice for over three years now. And when I switched to Seller Snap from a popular competitor, my sales literally went up by 15% in the first week. Uh, and Seller Snap just dropped a new feature that's gonna help a lot of sellers avoid some of those new low inventory fees that everybody's complaining about. And this new feature actually lets you view your historical days of supply per listing. So what does that mean? That means that to even take it a step further, you can set custom repricing rules based on how much supply you have left. So if I'm running low on stock and I know it's gonna take me a little bit to restock, I can set Seller Snap to automatically raise my price so that my inventory doesn't get too low and I don't get hit with those low inventory fees. So if you want the biggest discount that Seller Snap offers, which is 15% off your first three months, you can only get it using my code, which is BrandRocket, all one word, at checkout. So that code again is BrandRocket, which is all one word, for 15% off your first three months of Seller Snap. Now let's get right into the episode. Now, so you guys see the title of my presentation here, right? Leveraging Virtual Talent to Scale. This is a topic that I'm super passionate about. If you guys have been paying attention to any of my content, if you've ever listened to me talk before, uh, you know I have a really strong virtual team behind me that I'm really proud of. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna go into kind of the subtopic of how to outsource 90% of your wholesale business. So let's get right into it. All right, so first I'm gonna talk about what this presentation will not teach you guys, right? So first, I'm not gonna talk about where to find virtual talent. Everybody knows, go to onlinejobs.ph, go to Upwork, go to indeed.ph. Uh, there's some really good places to find talent and this presentation is gonna be a little higher level than that. Um, I'm not gonna tell you how much to pay your virtual employees because that's really gonna vary based on their experience, based on your budget and based on what you need them to do. And I'm not gonna teach you the basics, right? Like I said, this is gonna be a conversation with um, some tips and tricks that I think are gonna be a little more advanced for those of you that are in wholesale or those of you that are trying to scale your business. Now, what this presentation will teach you are tested tactics that actually work. So everything that I'm gonna be giving you here are real things that I've implemented in my business, stuff that works, stuff that, like I said, I've proven uh, time and time again. I'm gonna go into some tips that you might not have previously considered because uh, at the end of the day, the, the best information out there about virtual assistants uh, really comes from Fast Track FBA who's here somewhere, shout out to him. He's got some really good info on that stuff. Um, but I think some of the stuff that I'm gonna share with you guys uh, hasn't even been covered by him or elsewhere. So this is stuff that honestly, I feel like I could charge for, but uh, you know, it's good info that I think you guys, it's gonna help some of you guys out. And then it's gonna be some advice you can take action on, right? No theory, no, um, you know, just no fluff. This is stuff that, like I said, I use every day and it works. All right, so first, who the heck am I, right? Why am I qualified to get up here and give this presentation? So my name's Corey Ganim. Here's a very cheesy picture of me that, uh, I don't even know how old this picture is, but me standing up against a blue background. Um, I've done 12 million or more in wholesale sales lifetime. So I started selling on Amazon in May of 2017. I graduated from college on May 20th, 2017. And on May 22nd, I drove to every thrift store in my town, started buying up used books, very similar model to Avery over here, and started with used books, got into OA. And then January 6th of 2019 is when I started my wholesale journey. So I've been 100% wholesale ever since January 6th of 2019. I have six years of experience with virtual team members. And now, like many of you guys, I did everything. I made every mistake in the book starting out, right? I didn't vet my people. I hired the first person I interviewed. I made every single mistake. And I think I've learned a lot from that over the last six years. 90% of my wholesale business is outsourced at this point. So a lot of you guys have probably heard uh, me talk about my head of operations. Her name is Chriselda. 
She is an absolute killer. She's one of the first virtual employees that I found. I hired her in, I want to say November of 2019. And now she pretty much runs the show, right? She knows this business, honestly, better than I do at this point. So it's taken my workload down to about an hour per day on average uh, and still doing seven, multiple seven figures per year with her running the show. And I've been sharing my journey really since I want to say like January of last year. So I started sharing my journey uh, first on Twitter, then on YouTube, now more heavy on LinkedIn and Instagram. So I started getting active on social media in January, came here in March, met a lot of you guys last year, and that's really accelerated my growth. So that's something that if you're not sharing your journey on social media, guys, I promise you it will 10x your business in 10 times uh, a shorter timeline, right? So that's something that's been really key to my growth. Okay, so let's talk about what you should look for in a virtual employee. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, you got to find somebody that is a master of Keepa or somebody that you know, source profitable products before. In fact, I think all of that is irrelevant. When I am looking for a virtual employee, I'm looking for a couple of things. One, I'm looking for somebody who is coachable, somebody that is willing to take feedback, willing to take criticism, and then not just hear that, but hear that and implement it, right? I think coachability is incredibly important. Two, I'm looking for attitude, right? I'm looking for somebody that has a really good attitude because at the end of the day, if somebody can take criticism, but they do it with a bad attitude, that's not really somebody that I want to have on my team. And now if I have a virtual employee that has a bad attitude, it's only a matter of time before that mindset spreads to the rest of the team, right? And then uh, the third thing is I really look for strong communicators. I don't want a virtual employee that is going to come on board, that I've got to follow up with multiple times, that I've got to you know, prod and get them to try to give me the information that I need. I want somebody that's going to be proactive, that's going to be a good communicator, coachable and have a good attitude, right? At the end of the day, these are all the intangibles because the Amazon stuff's easy. We know the Amazon stuff. We can teach that to them, no problem. But the intangibles are the things that you can't teach. All right, so I have a pretty controversial opinion when it comes to employees that have previous Amazon experience. Now, you see this slide here where I say I actually avoid entirely folks that have that Amazon experience. And I'm going to tell you why. I have a pretty good reason for that. So um, here... I have a little story that I'm going to tell you about somebody named Mary. So Mary was an employee that we found her through jobs.ph, right? That's the place we find most of our folks. And Mary checked all the boxes on paper. She had just come off of a job. She had like a seven-year position with an eight-figure wholesale seller. She claimed that she helped him build his business from the ground up, very similar to the way Chriselda has helped me build my business. She knew how to source products. She knew the ins and outs of Seller Central. She knew how to submit applications for ungating. She, she said all the right things, right? She had the Amazon experience. Now, what we did is we extended her the two-week trial offer, which is something that I'm going to go into later in this presentation. And about two days into her trial, I'm not, I don't hear any feedback from Criselda, who's mainly in charge of training her. I assume everything's good, right? Because I'm not hearing anything. Now, I get a Slack message one morning from Priscilla saying, Corey, I can't take it. This is awful. You know, we, we've got to figure this out. I'm like, whoa, what's, what's wrong? Like, tell me what's going on. She said that because Mary had about seven years of ingrained knowledge of how she thought she should handle Amazon, it was taking Priscilla her entire day to help Mary unlearn what she knew and try to reteach her the way that we do things, right? So the feedback that I was getting was she's not following SOPs. She's doing things her way. She's just not listening. And so that doesn't mean that everybody that has previous Amazon experience is going to be that way. But like I said, guys, when I look to hire people, I look for those intangibles, the coachability, the attitude, and the communication. So that way, I can teach them the way that we do Amazon from scratch, because that's the easy part, right? So that's kind of my little warning when it comes to hiring folks that, that claim they know Amazon inside and out. Sometimes that can actually be a much bigger detriment than it will be an asset. Okay, so I do have a little bit of a caveat to that one claim that I just made. And that is for uh, hiring folks that are going to be doing product sourcing for us, right? Now, again, that's not to say you can't find somebody that has no experience sourcing and train them to be a killer sourcing employee. We've done that. But there is something to be said for somebody that knows how to read a keepograph, right? And now if we're going to hire somebody that has product sourcing experience, we're going to put them through 
what I call our sourcing test, okay? So if somebody comes to me and they say, hey, Corey, I wanna work for you guys. I wanna be a product sourcing employee. I know how to read Keepa. I found profitable products. I know what I'm looking for. I say, okay, great. Well, you're gonna have to prove it, right? So we put them through the sourcing test. Now the sourcing test is just where we give them uh, a subset of ASINs, ASINs that we know are good or bad beforehand, but I want them to prove to me why they're good or bad. So I might give a, a, a potential sourcing employee 10 ASINs and they got to pitch me on why an ASIN is good and why we should buy it or why an ASIN is bad and why we shouldn't buy it. So if I give them 10 sample ASINs and have them pitch to me why they're good or bad, it's not going to take me 10 ASINs to know whether they know their stuff or not, right? I can see right through them if they're not legit. And if they are legit, then they make it to the next level and we potentially just found a diamond in the rough. Okay, so let's go into a couple of recruitment tips. Now you see I've got here uh, the onlinejobs.ph logo. That is where we find most of our people. Again, that's gonna be probably the biggest talent pool, but there's a lot of fluff, right? There's a lot of people on there that they'll take anything they can get. They're not that talented, so it takes a lot of sifting through people that might not be the best fit for your business to find somebody that's really good. Okay, so the first tip I can give you here is to utilize what I call the banana trick. Now, honestly, I think this is a fantastic tip. I can't take credit for it. I heard this somewhere from somebody years ago. I wish I remembered who so I could give him credit. But this is what that looks like. So any of you guys that have posted a job on onlinejobs.ph, right? Raise your hand here if you've ever posted a job posting on onlinejobs.ph looking for a virtual employee, right? So that's probably a good quarter of the room, maybe a little less. Now, this has been my experience. I'm sure this has been your experience as well. When you post a job posting, especially if it's specific for an Amazon position, you probably get what? 100, 150, 200 applications within like 48 hours. I see some heads nodding because that's definitely been my experience, right? So if you get 200 applications, like we know there's gonna be some really quality employees in that mix. But guys, to sort through 200 applications, that's gonna take forever. Like that's basically an entire job in and of itself. So this is where the banana trick comes in handy. So we post our job posting and the job posting might be, let's say three or four paragraphs long, right? Cause we want it to be descriptive. We want to tell them what to expect. But what we do is let's say midway through the second or third paragraph, we're gonna bury a sentence, just random sentence in the middle of the second paragraph that says, hey, if you've read this far into the job posting, include the word banana in the subject line of your reply, right? And then we continue on with the job posting. So what that does, guys, I swear to you, I'm not making this up, this will eliminate 80 to 90% of applicants because when you get those 100, 150, 200 applications, guess how many people include the word banana in the subject line of their reply. If I get 200 applications, I get anywhere from 20 to 40 that include that word banana. So right then and there, guys, that eliminates 80% of the applicant pool. That just took my workload from, let's say, 10 to 20 hours to sift through those applications down to maybe one to two hours to sift through the ones that actually took the time to read my job posting, okay? So that's the banana trick. If I can give you any tip, if you take nothing else away from this presentation, utilize that next time you hire a virtual employee, it'll save you 10 to 20 hours. So the banana trick is great at disqualifying, let's say, you know, 80% of the people that sign up or that, that submit an application. But we want to further disqualify. Now, this sounds bad, but I want to make these people jump through as many hoops as possible to get to my interview round. And the reason for that is there are tens of thousands of them looking for jobs, but at the end of the day, there's only a small percentage that are actually quality employees. So we're gonna put a few additional disqualifiers into that job posting to further filter folks out. So what I like to do at the end of my job posting, and I make this, you know, I put this in bold font, I make this super obvious, super hard to miss, is I say, all right, if you've, you know, if you made it to the end of the job posting, respond with two things, one, is going to be a screenshot of your internet speed. Now, they all know just to go to speedtest.net and just screenshot whatever that number is. And two, I want you to submit a 30 second voice sample telling me why you're a good fit for this job. And I make it very clear that it is 30 seconds maximum. Because again, I'm testing them at every point. 
right? If the voice sample is 32 seconds, you're disqualified. I said 30 seconds. If you can't follow instructions, why would you be able to follow instructions when you're my employee, right? And then the speed test tells me, hey, is their internet any good? Am I going to have issues getting in touch with them? So they're kind of further disqualifying themselves. And then one other benefit of the voice sample is I get to hear how good their English is, right? Now, most of my employees, aside from one of them, they're not supplier facing. I don't necessarily need them to have perfect English, but this will tell me one, how good is their English? And two, can they concisely convey what they're good at, what they're not good at, whether or not they're a good fit for this job? Again, that's the, the, the um, what they say in the voice sample is not gonna make or break their chances. It's just gonna further tell me if they're a good fit, more so if they're a bad fit. So the next tip that I will give you guys is to batch your interviews, okay? So what I like to do, and again, this sounds bad, but bear with me. I use Calendly, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with, and I create an event, right? And the event name might just be virtual assistant interview. And I'm gonna put 20 minute time slots, and I'm gonna put, uh, and I'm gonna make it available, let's say on a three hour window on a Friday afternoon, right? Now keep in mind, these people are in the Philippines, 12 hours ahead, so if I open up interview slots from let's say noon to 3 p.m. Eastern, that's midnight to 3 a.m. their time, right? So again, I'm making them jump through as many hoops as possible to interview for my company. I wanna see who wants it. If you're gonna show up to a 2.30 a.m. interview after having jumped through three other hoops to get to this point, then you're either really good and you want this job or you're just super driven, right? And either way, that tells me something about your character. Also too, it's not super uncommon for these people to work Eastern time, right? So it's not like they're waking up in the middle of the night to join these interviews. More than likely, they're already, um, they're already up, they're already working another job, and they're just showing up for our interview. And again, I use that tool Calendly to batch those interviews into a three-hour window on a Friday afternoon, knock them all out in one go, and then from there, proceed to the next step, which I'll get to um, in another slide. And so guys, another tip is going to be when you get somebody on board, when you're onboarding them, or ideally during the interview process, I wanna confirm a couple of things. I wanna confirm one, their tech stack. Are they working on a 12 year old HP laptop? Or do they have a three monitor setup that with you know blazing fast internet speed where I know that's not gonna be an issue? Because trust me, this is an issue. Last week, literally last week, I had to buy my admin a new laptop because his laptop was about eight years old, right? I paid for half of it. He covered the other half, but that's something that I should have done during the interview process with him when I hired him a year ago, was confirm, hey, is your laptop gonna give out in a year and am I gonna have to replace it, right? Another great thing to do is to get an emergency contact from these people, because again, they're located in the Philippines, weather is a big issue, they get typhoons, they get hurricanes, power goes out, they don't have generators, there's any number of things that could happen to cut off communication between you and your employee, so it's as simple as, hey, uh, what's your spouse's WhatsApp number, right? If I can't get in touch with you, then I'm gonna send them a quick message and just make sure that you're okay. Simple as that. And then also just confirm that they have a backup power source, right? Again, this is not a deal breaker. I'm not gonna not hire somebody because they don't have a generator, but if they're a professional virtual assistant, if this is something that they do as their profession, they ideally are gonna be proactive and have these measures in place to get back to work in case things go south. Now, this is another huge tip, and it is to set expectations up front. There's nothing that's gonna set you up for failures quicker or easier than hiring an employee, you know, onboarding them to your Slack channel, or your WhatsApp channel, and start throwing tasks at them, right? Now, you can do that, and honestly, that's how I started, but when I started uh, conducting a legitimate onboarding call with my team, telling them what to expect, telling them the hours that I expect them to be available, giving them the SOPs that they're gonna be responsible for performing, getting them set up with their, uh, their company email address, getting them access to Google Drive, all the little things that you would probably do over the course of their first week. So much easier and so much more professional to do that in one simple one hour onboarding call right before you hire them, it lets them know like, okay, like these guys are legit, right? They don't mess around, they know what they're doing, I'm ready to go to work. So this is gonna be one of my bigger tips, and again, this has come from trial and error. And it is to always, always, always 
extend a two week trial offer. I'm gonna explain to you guys what that means. So when I say a two week trial offer, it's exactly what it sounds. When I find a, a candidate that I think is a great fit, I wanna hire them, I think they're, you know, I think they're gonna fit in great with my team. I, I stop for a second and I say, okay, remember what happened with Mary? She checked all the boxes. I thought she was gonna be you know, the best employee I've ever had. So what I do instead is I extend them a two week trial offer. And it's essentially, the conversation goes like this, like, hey, I think you're a great fit. Would love to have you on the team. I like, you know, I, I think you'd integrate very well, but let's give it a two week test, right? And the point of the two week test is so that I can get a feel for you, you can get a feel for me, the team can get a feel for you. And hey, if at any point during that two weeks, you feel like we're not a fit, or I feel like you're not a fit, I will pay you for your time and we will part ways, right? No harm, no foul, simple as that. I've only had to part ways with two virtual employees during the trial offer, which honestly saved me a lot of time and allowed me to go back to that candidate pool and choose my second best uh, candidate, extend them the trial offer, they crush it and we keep going. So it's just a way to kind of protect your interest while you're still feeling each other out for about two weeks. And the thing is guys, during the two week trial offer, it doesn't take two weeks to find out if they're a good fit. It takes about two days, right? It's exactly what happened with Mary. It's exactly what happened with the other employee that we've had to part ways with during the trial. All right, so another somewhat controversial opinion when it comes to hiring virtual employees is that at least for me, my company, we do not allow referrals, okay? So let me explain why. When it comes to referrals, Everybody has them, right? In the Philippines, again, I'm speaking specifically about the Philippines, and I'm sure a lot of you guys in here have virtual employees. They crush it for you, they're doing great. You need to hire another one, and they say, well, hey, uh, my cousin would love to work for you, or my brother, or my, or my uncle, or you know, whoever. Like, there's a lot of people in their direct family vicinity that they recommend you hire, right? Which is great in one way, because it gives you very quick access to talent, you've kind of already got that built-in trust because you know your existing employee is a killer, so more than likely their husband or their brother or their uncle or whoever is gonna be of the same quality, so you bring them on board. They More than likely, they've already been watching your existing employee doing their job, so it's a pretty easy plug and play. Now, this is where that goes wrong. And again, I'm speaking from experience here because this has burned me twice. So, I had two employees, they were sisters, or sorry, I had one employee, you know, she, her name was Nell, she had a sister named Kim. So I hire Nell, she does a great job. She's doing great work for me. And I say, hey, I need to hire a new VA. And she's like, oh, well, my sister Kim, she'd love to come work for you. In fact, she's been watching me do this sourcing every day. She knows exactly how I do it. She already knows pretty much what to do. Just you know, bring her on and give her a chance. So I said, great. So I bring on Kim. Kim and Nell are working side by side. They're in the same room, they're in the same house. And everything is going great for about six months. But what happens is, Nell's performance start to slip and Kim actually ends up being way better than Nell. So what ends up happening is now Kim is covering for Nell. Kim is giving Nell leads. Basically, Kim is doing everything in her power to keep me from firing Nell, right? So at the end of the day, I want to keep Kim because she's a fantastic employee, but what I end up having to do is I end up having to fire both of them because again, if I just fire Nell, I knew Kim was gonna leave anyways, it just ended up being a very sticky situation. So, and this has happened to me twice. And there's other people that I know that have large virtual teams that have the same, same policy, right? No referrals. It might be a little hard, harder to recruit because you have to start from scratch each time, but you avoid that conflict of interest. And it helps that, you know, the bad morale or bad performance of one team member is not going to bring the rest of the team down. And they're not going to be covering for each other because they have that vested interest in keeping each other on board. All right, so let's get into the most important thing that your team can do. And this speaks to the longevity of your company. This speaks to uh, helping remove yourself from the day-to-day -day operations. And it is all about documenting your processes, all right? So you guys are probably sick of hearing people talk about this. Create systems, create SOPs, document your processes. Yes, it's boring as hell, I'm not gonna lie. But guys, this is the type of stuff that helps you step away from your business. This is the type of stuff that gives your business resale value. And the best part is when you have 
employees, ideally virtual employees that are already executing these processes every single day as it is, it's really easy for them just to take a step back, record what they're doing, save that in something like a Google Drive or a, a Scribe How, an SOP tool, and you've got those systems for life. So again, using the example of Kim and Nell, when they left, we didn't have to start from scratch. We had the SOPs that they had created as a result of their everyday duties. Now, I'm going to tell you guys exactly how uh, we create those SOPs in a very easy way. So the most effective way to document your task is going to be to have employee A perform the task. Now, employee A is not the one that's typically responsible for, um, for performing this task, right? Employee B is going to watch them and create an outline while employee A is performing the task. And then they're going to get together after the fact. They're going to review that outline, and they're going to tweak as necessary. So what I like about this particular format of documenting your processes is if you just have the person that's used to performing the task, if you have them just create the SOP by themselves, they're so used to doing the task, they're going to skip over the nuances. They're probably going to leave some steps out. Bottom line is the SOP is probably only going to be about 80% of the way there because that task is so ingrained in their head. They just miss those little steps that somebody that would be newer to the process would pick up on. And when they get together and review the outline together, they can kind of bounce ideas off each other. Like, for example, hey, you know, you did this, but you didn't note it. Or, you know, you skipped over this step. Let's go back and add that real quick. It helps them just create a much more complete SOP. They pretty much do that for every single task within the business. And then, boom, you've got a, a built-out SOP library for everything that your team is doing. Again, so that way, if somebody leaves or if something happens, you're not starting over from square one. Now, it's my belief, guys, that the number one key to effective delegation is accountability, all right? It's one thing just to hire a virtual employee, hand them a task, ask them if they did it, and if they didn't, fire them. If they did, great, keep on going, right? But at the end of the day, accountability is a system just like anything else, okay? So we do accountability in a very specific way. So there's ways that we keep our team accountable, and one of those ways is a daily check-in call. Now, we used to do the daily check-in call where I get on a Zoom with my team and they report on our KPIs every single morning. What I found is that it was just as effective for them to host that call themselves, record it, and then send me the recording. I don't need to be on that call. So that way, I'm not tied to a specific meeting time. They save that recording in my email, each day, whenever I want to, I go in and I watch that recording. Usually it's five to 10 minutes. I watch them report on the KPIs. And then I can send them a quick Slack message if there's anything that I need them to elaborate on or if I have any questions. right? And it's simply them going through our KPIs one by one. The second way that we keep our team accountable is that we do daily PO reviews. So my head of operations, Griselda, she is responsible for placing orders, for deciding how many uh, units of a particular product to order, basically for getting POs to the finish line. And now the way, I ha the way I keep her accountable is when she places an order, she has authority to place orders without my involvement up to a certain dollar amount under the condition that we kind of debrief that order. So if she places an order, she sends me a video and she says, hey, this is the order that I placed. And I, and I, I record a video of me almost like reacting to that order. I say, okay. You said, you know, you bought 100 units of this ASIN. That looks great. That was a good job. You bought 200 units of this ASIN. Actually, I think you should have bought 250, and this is why. Or you bought 200, and I actually think you should have bought 100, and this is why. Right? So it's that constant feedback loop. So that way, every single time she places an order, she's getting inside my mind to continue sharpening her skills when it comes to buying. Because, guys, at the end of the day, when it comes to wholesale, Anybody that's been doing this for any amount of time knows that you make your money when you buy, and bad buys can really hurt you. And then the final way that we keep our team accountable, at least uh, in a structured perspective, is just daily check out message via Slack. And all that is is we have a team channel in our Slack. Whenever our team is done for the day, they send a quick message to that channel, literally just summarizing what they did, right? For example, Griselda might say, I place an order, I arrange six shipments. I followed up with this vendor, and I sent an email to XYZ. Simple as that. So that way, if I'm out for the day, like for example, if I'm here, I can just check that Slack, and within 10 seconds, know exactly what was done in my absence. 
Now, when it comes to how we incentivize our team, our bonuses are always going to be based on KPI achievement. Now, I think I said KPI before, but for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, that stands for Key Performance Indicator. And I define a key performance indicator as anything that's going to move our business forward, right? So for example, uh, weekly spend or weekly ASINs shipped to Amazon, right? These lead measures that move the needle that as those lead measures go up, our sales and our profit go up as well. So to give you an example of what a KPI would look like that we use to incentivize our team, and this is from a few quarters ago, but we had a KPI where we said, hey, we want to open five new brand direct wholesale accounts in the tools or automotive categories, right? And it's very cut and dry. It's very simple. If by March 31st, we have five brand new open accounts in those categories, great. We hit the KPI. Everybody gets their bonus. If we don't, if we have four, if we have three, if we have two, if we have one, then we don't get our bonus, right? Very simple, very cut and dry. And it allows the team to kind of come together and collaborate and basically combine their efforts to make sure that we hit that KPI. So in terms of things that we delegate, we'll delegate purchase orders up to a certain dollar amount. Like I said, Criselda has full authority to pull the trigger on orders up to a certain dollar amount without my input. We will delegate all of our supplier outreach and follow-up. So the only time I should be speaking to a new supplier is to get on the phone and close the deal and open the account. When it comes to day-to-day -day supplier communication, I'm not involved in that in any way. Ralph is the one doing the initial outreach, and Chriselda is, doing the one, uh, Chriselda is the one teeing up those accounts to either get on the phone with me so that I can close the account, or she's closing the account via email. And then any sort of admin function whatsoever is delegated. Seller central management in any way, shape, or form. Repricer management, um, you know, inputting our cogs into seller board, giving our cogs to our bookkeeper. Any sort of admin function is delegated. And then things that we won't delegate are, like I said, closing new accounts. Because at the end of the day, as good as Chriselda is, as good as my admin Ralph is, I want to be the one on the phone, sealing the deal, making sure that supplier is comfortable with me, comfortable with our company, and willing to move forward to open a wholesale account. When I say high-level supplier relations, that's simply me checking in with our best suppliers every week, every two weeks, just building rapport. Hey, how you doing? How are the kids doing? You doing any traveling, right? Just staying in front of them, really just getting them to like me. It's as simple as that. And then other thing that I will not delegate is profit first allocation. So for those of you that are not familiar with profit first, it is a great book by Mike Michalowicz. There's an e-commerce version that I highly recommend everybody in here reads. Uh, to kind of give you the summary, it's basically a financial framework where every two weeks when we get paid by Amazon, we take a percentage of that disbursement and put it into a different bucket, some of those buckets being profit, operating expenses, um, shipping costs, uh, let's see, inventory, and then prep fees, right? So that way, every time we get paid by Amazon, we already know where every dollar is going. And I'm the one making those allocations every two weeks, and it takes me 30 seconds to do. All right, so that's my presentation, guys. One last thing I'll leave you with, if you are a seven-figure wholesale seller and you want to join an elite community of very successful wholesale sellers, some guys that are even bigger than me, come talk to me. And if you're doing OA and you're looking to transition to wholesale, I've been cooking up something for you guys as well. Come talk to me. We've got a fantastic community. And I appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk to you guys.